I'm going to take this one away. Uh, no, I got, I got an idea. I got an idea. There right, you go. Okay. I'm ready. Go. What happens when two friends get together during a pandemic to talk about movies when they have a no audience and no listeners? We're not sure, but we're about to find out. I'm Duncan. I'm pretty sure I know. Movie theaters die. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ryan. We're both depressed. Let's start a podcast about films. Ryan, you care about me and my feelings. <laughs> Do you want to know what I've been up to? Absolutely. Please tell me, Duncan. Well, I think we're on month four of the quarantine. So I spend most of my time negotiating couch space with my cat and babysitting. And in honor of one of my favorite podcasts, You Made It Weird, what has made you laugh until you cry? And recently, um, while I was babysitting a four-year-old, they demanded, not requested, but demanded that I wipe their butt and they declared that they will never ever wipe their own butt. So that's the kind of intellectual conversations I've been having lately. Um, how about you, buddy? Sounds like our first guest on the pod. Uh, I'm doing well. I'm currently drinking away my sorrows. I've been binge watching The Last Dance and spoiler alert, father figures do not bode well in that doc about the Chicago Bulls 90s dynasty. So, uh, yeah, I'm just kind of feeling a little listless, a little sad, you know? I mean, we're all just Jordan in the end of game six, sobbing into a basketball. <laughs> Ryan, it seems like sad dads and bad dads tr bringing it back to film. Who was one of your favorite directors? Well, I think you're referring to Mr. Wes Anderson. Yes, I'm a stereotype. <laughs> we are men of a certain age, and while coming over our favorite films which we will do at the end of the podcast we're, we're growing that's what we're doing here we're trying to expand our films getting a variety of directors countries opinions worldviews anything else well duncan we are looking at movies that we enjoy uh some limited releases some indie picks prestige picks but we're trying to uh, have fun with them, highlight what we love about them, and just invite people to enjoy those movies as well and maybe create uh, and share that love of movies together. So if you're going to be joining this little book club, but for films that we're creating here, this wonderful little community, maybe you want to know who you're dealing with. Let's, let's rewind. Let's take it back to the very beginning, how we met, Duncan. You want to tell our story? You want me to. <laughs> So we Let me have tell you how I remember it. Let me just start on how I remember it. <laughs> so Ooh, we're turning I, into Rashomon already. Here. <laughs> so Duncan and I used to uh, lead bicycle tours for a nonprofit uh, across the country. When I first met Duncan, it was the fine year of 2014, year of our Lord. We were going to lead a tour from Bar Harbor, Maine to Seattle, Washington. I'll fast forward some of the details, but in the end, when I, I went to a friend's wedding, I catch up with the tour after they started. I'm in upstate New York. I find Duncan, who I do not know very well, on his computer editing hours of footage of an American flag. I ask him what in the hell he's doing. He is continuing to edit, and then he just shows me all these pictures he took of the flag as well. Uh, and that is when I knew, Duncan, you were for me and also discovered your American flag fetish. I'll try to put this in more poetic terms. We're hanging out in a state park bathroom, <laughs> as most men do. <laughs> Normal. When you're on a bike tour, outlets are in short supply. Ryan's looking at my video of flags blowing in the wind, trees waving, and he says, what are you, some Terrence Malick wannabe? And I remember whipping my head around and thinking this insult is the greatest cinematic compliment I've ever received. And therefore, our relationship was solidified in a state park bathroom, and we've never looked back. Yeah, we, I remember, I do actually, I'd forgotten I made that joke. And I do remember after that, you and I talked about every movie that came to our mind, wondering if the other had seen it, or if they'd heard of this director or that cinematographer. And we just basically nerded out. 
So a cinematic pissing contest in a bathroom. <laughs> like all good cinephiles, we immediately tried to one up each other for several several hours. So that's that's one thing we're going to try not to do with the podcast. We will be talking about prestige pictures, but we are going to be doing it without being pretentious pricks. So let's get some art films and make them more accessible. So what are some of the films that we have seen together? I mean, one of the one of the classics in our in our little uh, archive is definitely Rover, David Mashad's Rover. We went and saw that. Where's my car has become in uh, just a real where's my a cat? Real, yeah, it's become one of the real uh, bulwarks of our lexicon. Uh, we probably reference it more than is emotionally healthy. Uh, Duncan, what else? Uh, yes, any film that involves Guy Pierce. I'm a Guy Pierce guy. Ryan's a guy. Richie. We obvi- we argue about who is the superior guy often. Who's I your guy? That who's your you. guy? I'm Richie. He's Pierce. And he's wrong. And we'll be discussing more topics like that in the future. But yes, any film that's got Guy Pierce and Robert Pattinson mumbling along to um, Girl Pop inside an abandoned wasteland future, I'm on board. Exactly. So yeah, Duncan and I have uh, been on probably four bike tours over 10,000 miles. Uh, It included a lot of movies, a lot of laughs, a lot of exploring. Um, Another movie that came to mind was when we were in New York City and we saw uh, Don't Think Twice about uh, comedians and improv comedians, uh, something that's near and dear to Duncan's heart. And that was an enjoyable film. I will be gushing about New York City quite a bit on this podcast. Recently, I took a trip back to 1970s New York with Al Pacino and watched Serpico and Dog Day Afternoon. Is there anywhere else special we went, Ryan? Teeing you up for the home run here? Duncan, I believe you're referring to the Royal Tenenbaum house that we went to, and that was amazing. Um, We got to go to Archer Avenue itself. Uh, We stood on the steps where Pagoda stabbed Royal Tenenbaum. I did not stab you the way he did, but I reenacted other great moments uh, like yelling, I know you asshole at you and uh, seeing the spot where Buckley died, RIP Buckley. I probably was not aware that there was a Royal Tenenbaums reference and just Ryan harassing me as usual. Duncan, where else have we been? Something you might want to uh, reference? The greatest pilgrimage of all, the true touchstone of our relationship besides girl talk which i am forever indebted to ryan for introducing me to that music makes my hips do things i did not know was possible but back to something a little more let's keep this pg a little more artful a little more thoughtful there's a lot of um a little less carnal (laughs) there's a lot of fanboys in the film world but are there a lot of art film fanboys who go to smithville texas go tigers and eat grass off the sacred ground where the tree of life was filmed we did indeed and uh i still to this day not only was it amazing let's just get off the top it was amazing they give you a little map you know you go to little their little city hall they give you a little map you get to see all the spots i also wondered when you go to the house you see that it is still lived in (laughs) sacrilege we should start a holy war (laughs) Why don't we just start a never-ending GoFundMe page to raise three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars to buy a house in small town Texas? Or we could start crusades to expel them from the Holy Land. Are we making <laughs> crusades jokes? Too soon? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, and uh, and yeah, I saw the people who were living there, and uh, it was uh, it was very funny because I just imagined them being like, "Honey, it's another couple of those weird Malik disciples out front of our door, like just middle aged white boys who were dirty, just like clearly way too much time on their hands." I I definitely uh, felt like we probably were not the first, and uh, we're fulfilling more stereotypes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a niche market. I've been there three times. It's not stalker status yet, is it? I don't know. Do you have a restraining order? Not that I'm aware of. (laughs) Don't go to the city hall of Smithville. You're probably on a most wanted poster. (laughs) So Duncan, moving on, uh, let's talk about some movie memories. Memories of cinema that moved you, made you laugh, made you cry, made you feel things, and expanded your balloon of love. The first film I remember seeing in theaters was The Adventures of Baron von Munchausen. Have you ever seen that one? 
I have not. I don't even know what you just said. Oh, it is fantastical. It sounds Can like you- Nazi propaganda. <laughs> Baron von Muchausen. Not all Germans are Nazis, Ryan. <laughs> okay, continue. The Adventures of Baron von Munchausen, directed by Monty Python's Terry Gilliam, starring a man I don't know, but featuring, I believe, a very young, one of her first roles, Uma Thurman, as well as Robin Williams as a very randy decapitated moon. So yeah. Are you are you aware that people can't see you when you do those little <laughs> gestures? <laughs> those little gestures were me. Searching through the air to find the answer. Oh, okay. I thought that was like part of your bit. <laughs> so yeah, we have Duncan's first cinematic memory, a Randy decapitated Robin Williams, a very young Uma Thurman playing a Venus de Milo type character and just complete shenan- shenanigans out there. Um, my parents like to tell me that my first, the first movie memory they have of me is me walking the aisles, I think, bored at Gone with the Wind. So you could say I was a little activist at the, at a, as a young age or just a bored child who doesn't want to see Antebellum South. I mean, take your pick. But I mean, you definitely could just say you were doing a protest. You were marching up and down the aisles and trying to fight. You know, what's your earliest memory, Ragai? Oh, well, my earliest memory, uh, well, I, probably my earliest memory watching a movie wasn't the one I'm going to tell you about, but the first time I remember really feeling something at the movies was uh, seeing Lion King, 94, six years old. And, uh, you know, you know, when Mufasa, when Mufasa eats it, I cried. And uh, I think that's the day I discovered sadness. <laughs> so there's a little, there's a little age difference between Ryan and guys. So while he was in 1994 crying about Mufasa's death, I was sobbing over the loss of Kurt Cobain and in a very different area the repeated losses of the Fab Five in the NCAA Finals so we can swing from emotional teen to bro just like that you're trying to bring me back to last dance Jalen Rose and Gus Uh uh-huh um, another one that, uh, really stuck with me as a kid was, so I grew up, uh, on a farm outside of Lincoln, Illinois. My mom would bring us home VHS tapes from the library, things she thought we would be interested in. And sometimes she'd take us with, um, and she would let us pick them out. I remember we picked out the never ending story, didn't know anything about it, but man, I was so terrified of the nothing. And I think that's the day I discovered existential dread. Uh, Ryan, to be clear, were you scared of nothing or Gamork, the messenger of the nothing? I think I think I was terrified of it all. <laughs> and then also I cried when Atreyu died. Ryan, you are getting everything wrong here. Atreyu does not die. Artax, the horse oh. dies. <laughs> <laughs> I can not remember the names. So let's, should we stick out for the top or do you want to include that? As no, good? I want to include me schooling you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. I mean, Duncan, you want to you want to throw a couple in here? I'm going. Yeah. So I'd say my earliest film memories, Never Ending Story, was certainly up there. My parents got that film in the old clamshell VHS box uh, when one of our cats died because they heard it would be good for children who are dealing with loss. Oh, my gosh. We're seeing a reoccurring theme here. The films that traumatized us in our youth have stuck with us. Never Ending Story... It's still my favorite film. And going back, Dumbo, that one certainly traumatized me. Do you remember Dumbo getting drunk and having horrible hallucinations? I do. (laughs) That takes me back. (laughs) Yeah. Is that one of the reasons I have only drank one time in my entire life? Quite possibly. Another traumatizing experience, seeing the film Aliens uh, when I was in the third grade and basically crying in the armpit of my friend Jamie. What's up, Jamie? Still one of my favorite films. Still one of my best friends. Traumatic situations bring people together. Aliens wasn't even good. <laughs> the James am- Cameron one? The second one? Yes. Uh, I, apparently, we're getting to our first hot take. I think Aliens is not only the best alien film. I also really like Prometheus. I'm going to get all the hate. Actually, I like Prometheus, too. 
So let me just cue you in. When you disagree with Duncan, and it's something he feels passionately about, he's liable to rip his shirt off in a fit of rage, throw a tantrum, whip it around his head shirtless, and then smash something. Well, it's it's one of your finest qualities. So uh, before we get Duncan in one of his tantrums, uh, we'll let that one go. Hi, Bridget. <laughs> uh, Jurassic Park. That one stuck with me. Also just scared the living crap out of me. Um, I will never forget the first time the T-Rex breaks out of the fence and I will never forget that kitchen scene with the kids, uh, and just being generally terrified. Uh, and then my last one, uh, not a traumatic experience, but something that actually, I think really exemplifies how movies captured my imagination. I think everybody can, uh, you know, relate if they love movies. Uh, my dad showed me the original star Wars also VHS also from the library. I just remember after the movie was over and my mom was trying to put me to bed, I was brushing my teeth and just kept asking her like, what happened to Darth Vader? Because he was still out there. And I just kept like, had visions of his ship spinning through space and then flying away. And I was just, I was just fascinated. Like, oh man, like the good guys won, but it's not over. And I was just, it was just uh, enthralling. So that's probably my strongest movie memory. The only time I got un- unadulterated TV screen time was at my grandma's house to a cable. And I watched a lot of movies on there. <laughs> Some of them, my, my dad would not have approved of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So growing up, certainly uh, spent a lot of time on that couch watching HBO, maybe even a little Cinemax. HBO. If I was bossy. <laughs> Way out of line on my household. <laughs> I was a little bad boy. I was running around with a hatchet in the backyard in fourth grade after I saw Last of the Mohicans. So Duncan, you want to talk about some movies that that you just love? Then we obviously will have some. I mean, Tree of Life doesn't count. Don't say it. We already know it. We both it love counts. It. I'm no. making I'm making a very loose top ten. Just so you know, you guys can't see the notes Duncan's created. He has free associated alphabetically an enormous amount of films. <laughs> On our show notes, which we will not subject you to reading all of them. I mean, I could give you top five films that start with T or B or A or L. So yeah, we'll we'll go through my loosely constructed top 10 films. These are the films that if I was on a desert island, I would take these. Maybe not my favorite, but we need a little bit of variety. Or if I, you know, was trapped in the mountains during a quarantine per se, a more likely situation. Uh, So this is the first top 10 film list I've probably made in about 10 years since I was an angsty little film school boy. So hopefully I've matured a little bit, but you'll see there's still a good chunk of angst on there. So number 10, I'm kicking it off with Taxi Driver. I didn't want to leave uh, Scorsese out. I think Aviator may be my favorite Scorsese film, but I needed Scorsese. Really? Huh. Oh, Aviator can bring me I like Aviator, but that just surprises me because I feel like Scorsese has so many more go-tos that most people would pick. Interesting. We'll yeah. get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah. So I also want a dirty New York on there. So that's why number 10 is your taxi driver. Number nine, I thought I needed a little bit of romance. And I was, as I was coming across this, I figure all my favorite romance films do not end well. You know, that's something that my, that uh, Katie, uh, who's my wife, she, uh, she also noticed that whenever we watch romance films, she's like, is it's like is there something about you like that you just like <laughs> relationships that don't work out? And uh, I believe she was a little concerned that maybe I might try to live out some of my favorite films <laughs> in our relationship. <laughs> well, two years ago, it's strong. Yeah, so we're going over angsty romance films. I got to throw out uh, Vanilla Sky, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. The Baxter, I think that's the only romantic comedy where things end well that I like, but I'm throwing in Brokeback Mountain. Nothing's going to hit you in the gut a little bit harder than that one for me. I don't know why I want to feel lonely on a desert island, but I put it on there. It's a blind spot for me. Brokeback Mountain. It's been been on my list for a long time. You haven't seen it? Yeah, I've got some blind spots, man. That's a blind spot for me. Then we will definitely go over that at some point. Yeah, we got to go over that one. So number eight for me, my favorite Coen Brothers film, A Serious Man. When I'm going to want to feel existential about dread, that's the one I'm going to go to. But there's also a good bunch of laughs on there. Number seven, There Will Be Blood. 
as we're saying, we are we are young men of a certain age. We need our angsty Paul Thomas Anderson on there. Bastard in a basket is something Ryan likes to whisper to me quite often. And our other most quotable film coming in at number six, The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford. The only thing longer than that title is the actual runtime of that film. Two and a half hours, but it's gorgeous. And, and still too short. Whenever Ryan and I just, you know, are in the mood to kill each other, don't that picture look mighty dusty. Cue song. So, Duncan, uh, I have 10 films that I feel like I just always come back to. Uh, I've never tried to rank them, uh, mostly just because they uh, they all are so different to me. Uh, they show different parts and stages of my life and like just learning films, loving films. So I'll hit you up with five real quick. As mentioned, I am a Wes Anderson disciples. So Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. That was my introduction to Mr. Anderson. I still remember coming into my buddy's dorm room. It was plain. I asked him, what are you watching? And he told me and I watched about, started about, watched the last two thirds of the film and was just fascinated by the style, the jokes, the characters. It was just so unique. Um, so I'll never forget that. Uh, no Country for Old Men, a uh, huge Coen Brothers fan. I feel like that one uh, is their masterpiece on so many different levels, in my opinion. Entertainment uh, being part of that. I think there's other ones I maybe like more, um, but that one is just, it, it has uh, the ideas behind it and then it just packs a punch every time. Into the Wild, directed by Sean Penn. It's about Christopher McCandless. Uh, as mentioned, Duncan and I led bicycle tours. We both have lived fairly nomadic lives. And going out of college, Into the Wild, I wanted to uh, actually pattern my life after Christopher McCandless. He was an inspiration for me. Again, we are men of a certain age. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were both in agreement that, that, that we were not big fans of that film. What, Into the Wild? No, I'm going to throw a tantrum. <laughs> I love that movie. Bring it, baby boy. Into the Wild is amazing. Ignore Duncan. And then rounding out, Up in the Air. Uh, I felt like Up in the Air was uh, a performance by Clooney. That really moved me. I think that I understood just some of the nuance that goes into performances uh, simply by observing him in that film. And I think it really uh, speaks to me. I think it's powerful talking about relationships uh, and feeling isolated and what love is, particularly in hard times, <laughs> topical. And then A Single Man by Tom Ford, which is Colin Firth plays a gay professor who decides to kill himself at the end of the day. And the rest of the day is just him going through the relationships and the memories. Some of the things that have driven him to that decision. I think it's really emotionally powerful and resonant, very human. And just about the perspective of someone who is so outside of society's norms, he feels unloved and uh, unwanted. And it's really powerful. <laughs> Stone Cold World. All right. My number five, Aliens. This movie has been with me for over 25 years now. I think it is perfection of craft. Ellen Ripley is the finest feminist hero of our generation. I'm fine with that. And it can just bring me to tears. I absolutely love it. Fun fact. When? Had, when can it bring you to tears? They're just murdering aliens with machine guns all the time. Uh, the loss of human life. The power struggles. Did I want to be Vasquez in that film? Yes. Speaking of interesting gender norms, I had an Aliens 3 poster <laughs> above my bed when I was little. <laughs> it explains so much. So number four, we've talked about it. We will talk about it. We will even whisper about it, won't we, brother? Tree of Life, my number four film. I remember seeing this and Drive around the same time and thinking, okay, plot is not at all necessary in films. <laughs> Sometimes it's just pure poetry, it's music, and you go with the flow and you just watch the pretty images go by. True, good stuff. Number three. Number three, Wet. <laughs> Hot American Summer. I was wondering when that was going to show up. <laughs> this this is a film that just blew up my mind. Uh, directed by David Wayne, 
written and starring by Michael Showalter, all of the people from the state, New York alt comedy scene, Janine Garofalo. We even have Christopher Maloney as a refrigerator humping cook. There's just too many good people on this. Uh, this turned me on to the show Stella, which I believe is the finest cinema that's ever been created. I, I got to have some comedy on there. It's necessary. We've tried to re review comedy. We don't think we can. You either like it or you don't. So, and I love Very subjective. Wet, Hot, Wet Hot American Summer. Uh, the DVD comes with a commentary track and also an extra farts track. Were you aware of that, Ryan? I was not. I've been so, deprived. Yeah. I've clearly been deprived. If I bring that to my desert island, there are many different ways that I can appreciate that film. And so that leaves us to number one and number two on my list. And when I bring these up to people, they say these films couldn't be any different. And I say they are the exact same story. Never Ending Story and Fight Club. They are both about little boys trying to become men with their fictional characters. So Bastion is Jack and Atreyu is clearly Tyler Durden. And they're just trying to figure out how to overcome depression or just absolute nihilism, as Rye Guy has said. And will those little boys become men? To be determined. S stare that void in the face, you know? <laughs> yeah, Never Ending Story, is, it, it's not a children's film. It's all about depression. You got to get through the swamps of sadness. You have to leave home to grow up. Uh, there are those traumatic um, sphinxes. And then, in the end, and then in the end, the nothing gets you anyway. <laughs> but there's a, there's, there's a shimmer of hope when the childlike empress lets you recreate the world in your vision. So yeah, when everyone's all upset about remakes and their youth being torn from them, Never Ending Story was my favorite film. Never Ending Story 2 with Jonathan Brandis. No, thank you. Never Ending Story 3 with a talking tree. You think I'd like from Tree of Life, but it doesn't work in Never Ending Story 3. And Jack Black as a villain and all the TV spinoffs. You can't destroy my childhood. It's already been there. So that's why Never Ending Story holds up for me. Yeah, it's a good one. I uh, I like that movie a lot. Plus, it's got that great uh, 80s aesthetic of actual puppets and uh, actual, uh, you know, production uh, on sets and stuff rather than just CGI, which I think lends a certain aesthetic that is nostalgic and also just unique and beautiful. Yes. Texture, baby. Texture. I want to touch it. So, yeah, <laughs> once, once this quarantine is over... I still have to make my pr pilgrimage because there is the real Falcor uh, puppet in Germany. So yes, I will go there. I will go to, it's like film studio Bavaria. They have all the props there and my little brain will melt and I'll be a puddle of happy little bastion boy. Glad we, uh, glad we established that. <laughs> we know what your future holds. So Duncan will die by seeing the Falcor prop. Um, so my other five films, uh, I'm a huge McDonough brother fan. Uh, it's Martin McDonough and John Michael McDonough. Uh, they have both made several good films. Uh, so their films uh, come from a very Irish Catholic background in wrestling with humanity and their Catholic upbringing. Um, but I think that they do a great job of mixing dark comedy uh, with real themes and powerful uh, human stories. So In Bruges and Calvary. Both make my list there. Tree of Life, uh, I mean, what more can be said that hasn't already been said? Duncan and I will say more about that. <laughs> um, don't you worry. But yeah, Tree of Life is going to make it. And then rounding out is Mr. Brad Pitt himself. The assassination of Jesse James. Still, to this day, uh, the reason Roger Deakins is my favorite cinematographer he was, that film still stands out to me watching it in college, uh, showing me the power of what uh, the camera could do. I think that if I hadn't seen that movie, I would not have appreciated Tree of Life as much as I, ha as I did. Uh, and I think cinematography is definitely the thing about, or the element of filmmaking I'm most interested in, uh, and I think speaks to me the most. And then uh, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. I mean, I know it's a lesser Fincher in a lot of people's minds. I feel like it's an epic. Uh, you walk with a man through his life, you feel like by the end, who uh, is irredeemably different than those around him. And the pain and love and sadness and beauty 
uh, that life entails is all mixed up. And I, I still almost, I watch that movie every year and almost cry every time. I, I maybe have not cried once when I've seen that. Let yourself go, Brian. Feel the healing. I know. It still gets me. I mean, when that water rushes in, I still remember seeing that in theaters. And when the water rushed in, after it goes through all the characters and the clock is going and it just, oh, it brought me, it broke me. So good. So good. So come what at you, me. What are your favorite McDonough brothers? What What is the one that you always yell at me and are mad at me that not knowing it line for line like you do? In Bruges. <laughs> Basically, my brother and I have a... Uh, a language where we just quote in Bruges at each other constantly through text and phone call and in person. So I, I, I might know that movie pretty close line for line. Best line? Oh, please. How am I even supposed to pick? I don't even know. I guess two really ones that stand out to me is when they're going to have the shootout. I suppose you got a gun up there. Yeah. Well, what are we going to do? We can't stand here all night. Why don't you both put your guns down? Go home. Don't be stupid. This is the shootout. <laughs> and he's so disdainful. Oh, it's so great. And then, uh, and then maybe the other one is uh, that my brother and I often repeat is uh, Brendan Gleeson and Colin Farrell are in a uh, a cathedral, and in that cathedral there is a vial of Jesus's blood and Brendan Gleeson is trying to get Colin Farrell to go see it. And Colin Farrell, after listening to him, goes, do I have to? <laughs> and then Brendan Gleeson goes, have to? Of course you don't fucking have to. It's just Jesus fucking blood, isn't it? Of course you don't have to. Of course you don't fucking have to. And they just <laughs> But I mean, there's other great ones like two manky hookers and a racist dwarf. I mean, oh, yes. <laughs> it's the gift that keeps giving. The common themes between all our films is uh, some religious angst, the outsider, and some very, very dark humor. Yeah, that about rounds us out there, Dunks. That's who we are. So hopefully you will come along with us for the ride as we go through the history of cinema, but most mostly the recent stuff. Um, Rye Guy, you want to hmm. talk about some of the episodes we have coming up in the next month or so? And then we're going to get into Kelly Reichert. Uh, I really love Kelly Reichert. She's one of my favorite indie filmmakers. She just came out with First Cow this year. There's a lot of buzz that it's one of the best of the year so far. Uh, so I'm real excited to revisit that. And that has taken me back to seeing, uh, re-watching Wendy and Lucy, Night Moves, uh, Meek's Cutoff. And then I caught up with some ones I haven't seen, like River of Grass, her original. Yeah, Wendy and Lucy brought me to tears. I give that, I think it had two half tiers and one full tier. That may be a common rating system throughout this. Angsty boys do cry. We'll prove you wrong about that. So other episodes, we, we'd be going over the work of Trey Schultz, who broke onto the scene with Cresha. Also, It Comes at Night, as well as his most recent film, Waves. We're also going to San Francisco. We're going to watch... The Last Black Man in San Francisco. Medicine for Melancholy? There yeah, we Medicine go. for Melancholy. Yeah, yeah. I was, trying uh, to look, I was trying to look it up as we were talking. Barry Jenkins' first film. And also a classic that I don't think either of us has seen, Bullet, starring Steve McQueen. Also, we should maybe do a Barry Jenkins episode because Moonlight, oh, one of my favorite films of the recent decade or so. And then If Beale Street Could Talk, also well worth. We'll find a way to tie them all in there. So leave some comments. Send us some wonderful, loving fan mail. Give us some gifts. The real reason I'm doing this podcast, I just want those screeners. Just send me some Academy screeners, some critic circles. Just give me those Blu-rays. I just want to get my Academy vote so I can get the Academy's head out of its ass. I don't think that's even a hot take. <laughs> Uh, I'm on Letterboxd as well. Uh, Waladarski is the name, also Life Aquatic reference. And Ryan Davis is the real name. So if you want to see what I'm watching on there and become a friend and uh, we can argue about movies on there and both agree that Duncan's wrong. If that's what brings America back together again, <laughs> a common hatred for Duncan's love of film, so be it. <laughs> let's go out there and do the good work what do you say ryan we're going on tour <laughs> watch for us on tour five years from now once we pass a hundred listeners <laughs> welcome welcome to your birthday party <laughs> if you have a couch 
we've got sleeping bags. Let the tour begin. Yeah, we could just take do the bike tours of old, except this time just hang out with people and drink beer and talk about movies. Except you don't drink beer. Yeah, Dumbo traumatized me. Why would I ever drink beer after seeing Dumbo? All right, I feel like we're rambling now. So uh, let's bring it to a close. So look for the next Kelly Reichardt episode as well as some of these others. And thanks for joining us here on whatever the name of this podcast is. Hardly the hottest podcast. (laughs) Bastion made many other wishes and had many other amazing adventures before he finally returned to the ordinary world. But that's another story. (laughs) 